Welcome to the Bothell City Council regular meeting of February 13th, 2018. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All council members are here. Um, meeting agenda approval, or is that, there are any changes to tonight's meeting agenda? See none. Uh, visitor comment. So um, each person addressing the council will give his or her name in an audible tone of voice for the record, and unless the council grants further time, shall limit the address to three minutes. No person other than the council and the person having the floor will be permitted to enter into any discussion either directly or through a member of the council without the permission of the mayor. I have no sign up sheets. Does anybody want to give public comment? No? Okay. Next is our study session, AB 18-025, a briefing from Wa Washington State Department of Transportation and Sound Transit. And I believe, who's gonna kick us off here? Aaron Leanhart, the Public Works Director. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Aaron Lenhart, Public Works Director. Uh, I am just going to introduce the first, um, the lead off speaker from each of the two organizations and then they can introduce their team. So we will be starting with Kim Henry from WashDOT and uh, for Sound Transit, Paul Cornish will be starting off the conversation, but I will hand it over to Kim. Um, evening Mayor and Council Member. Uh, thank you for having uh, us here tonight. And uh, with me here tonight is, is Ed Berry. Um, he's uh, the director of the Toll Division. Uh, he's got a, a couple of slides here in the middle that uh, he's gonna be talking about. And so here we go. Um, start off with, I uh, like to remind everybody that we have a master plan for Interstate 405. It is a, a multi-modal, multi-agency plan. And over the years, we've been working on this uh, with all of our partners and making a lot of great progress throughout the corridor. Um, we recently, with uh, funding from Connecting Washington as well as from the ST3 package that recently passed, uh, have added to uh, the number of funded projects. And so uh, with, uh, with the funding we've got in place, we're really making a, a lot of great progress. And, and particularly with some of the projects we're gonna talk about here uh, tonight, we're, we're going to see a, a lot of changes happening in this corridor between now and 2024. Um, one of the things that's really helped us in uh, the, with our, our master plan as a, as a whole was our executive advisory committee. Um, they've been in, involved in the very beginning in helping us to uh, select the, the preferred alternative in the, in the master plan, but they've also been uh, very important in terms of uh, helping us with uh, major policy issues and also uh, they've done a lot in terms of lending support to the legislature in terms of funding priorities and putting together funding and phasing strategies. Um, and, and that's played a, a very important part with the legislature in terms of developing next steps uh, as, as we've been looking at some of these different uh, options as we move forward. Um, so with uh, the Connecting Washington package that, that recently had passed, um, we have the opportunity now uh, to uh, complete a 40-mile corridor of express toll lanes, which was one of the recommendations that did come out of our executive advisory group, and that was uh, to connect the hot lanes that we have on Highway 167 in with a dual lane express toll lane on Interstate 405. But we had a, a, a missing gap right in the middle, and that's where the orange piece is. That's Renton to Bellevue. And, and so uh, with the Connecting Washington package, we, we are now able to uh, move forward with that particular project. Um, and, and we're making some pretty good progress with that. But we also have other needs within the corridor. And so besides the funded projects, uh, we have some very clear needs in this particular area of 405, the area between Highway 522 and Highway 527. Um, and that's highlighted on the map with uh, the purple uh, lines that, that you see up in, in this particular area. And then at the very south end, we also have needs in terms of getting uh, the express toll lanes eventually all the way down into the, the Puyallup area. Um, those, neither of those projects are currently funded for construction, but uh, we continue to work on those and those are priorities that, that we're starting those conversations with, uh, with uh, our, our uh, executive advisory group as well as uh, local leaders throughout the corridor. 
Um, and part of the reason that we really have uh, the need to continue to work on the master plan is because we have so much growth going on in this area. Just in the last two years um, since we've opened uh, the express toll lanes, we've had almost 170,000 new residents move into this area. Um, but what's probably even most amazing to me is almost 150,000 new out-of-state driver licenses have been issued in King and Snohomish County. And so we had a lot of congestion in this area before we ever uh, had all those folks move in, but we add that on top of the congestion we have, and it just really continues to add to the, the problems that, that we have here. And so we need to continue the work within the master plan uh, to take those next steps, and once we, we get those next steps figured out, then we need to continue the work on the steps beyond that, uh, which is a, a lot of the work that we've been doing here very recently, is trying to prioritize those next round of projects. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Ed to talk about uh, some of the, the express toll lane. <clears throat> uh, good evening again, Mayor and Council Members. Thanks again for having me again. I'm Ed Berry, Director of the Toll Division at WashDOT. So my few slides as part of this presentation are having to do with toll performance and express toll lane performance for the project that's already out there in Bellevue to Linwood. So uh, I'm gonna start with some of the basics of Bellevue to Linwood uh, and the performance measures that we've had and some of the things that we've been seeing over the last two years since it's been in operation. So uh, starting off real basically, uh, it's been open for two years uh, last September. We have a dual lane section in the south end between Bothell and Bellevue and of course the single lane section between uh, Bothell and Linwood. Uh, the hours of operation are between 5 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday through Friday only. And then we have uh, exemptions for uh, single occupant vehicles uh, who pay the toll. So those are toll payers. And then we have exemptions for transit and van pools who are always exempt. And then uh, we have qualifying carpools who are exempt uh, during certain hours of operation. Uh, we have three plus carpools are exempt during the peak periods between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. And then we have the two plus carpool exemption in between from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So those are the, the real basic operations of how it looks out there today. Uh, you'll notice in the graphic there, the purple line there in the northbound direction, that's the PQ shoulder that I'm gonna talk more about in a couple slides. And that opened in April of 2017. That's providing a lot of benefit out there. So, uh, more on the basics of how it operates. Uh, it uses a dynamic pricing algorithm to control the price of the express toll lanes when it's in operation. Uh, it updates every five minutes when it's in operation. It's a minimum of 75 cents and a maximum of $10. And as congestion increases in the express toll lanes, the algorithm can understand that. And it increases the price to disincentivize people from getting in there to attempt to keep as much free flow as we can. And then at the shoulders of the peaks and as the peaks begin to wane, the algorithm can also understand that. It brings the toll price down to uh, uh, increase uh, throughput, but also uh, to incentivize more people to get in there. So that's the basics of how the algorithm works. Um, the, the toll vehicles always pay the toll uh, that they see when they enter the lanes. And the average toll during the peak periods for this period of which that I'm talking about uh, which is the last quarter of the two years between July and September, the average toll during that peak was $2.82, and two-thirds of that toll were under $4. And so if you look at that graphic on the upper left, it gives you the breakdown of the tolls that were paid during this uh, last quarter of the two years, 69% uh, between $0.75 cents and $4, 20% between $4 and $8, 11% between $8 and $10. So that's the breakdown of how it works and the, to the tolls that were paid in that last quarter. Another interesting graphic that I like to point out on below the, the circular diagram there is a graphic of the percent of weekdays with a $10 toll rate. And if you look at the, the green line especially, which is the northbound direction, you can see the preponderance of $10 tolls starts to wane in the winter and spring and summer of 2017. And that's an indicator of when the PQ shoulder opened. Uh, that really helped the operations of the northbound direction in the afternoon. And what that did is also, when operations improve, 
the operations in the express toll lanes improve, the preponderance of $10 toll rates goes down, and that's what that graphic indicates. Uh, we also did a couple surveys uh, this summer to, uh, to try and understand what our customers and what drivers are seeing out there. Many of you have perhaps seen this slide in the EAG. Uh, so we, we had a surveys of not only our good to go customer accounts, uh, uh, account holders, but also 405 drivers that use 405 and didn't necessarily use the express toll lanes. And we asked, we asked the question, do you like having the option of, of the express toll lanes for a faster trip? And we had 60% of respondents indicate they did. And so that was a big improvement of what, what we've seen in the past. And the graphic to the right of that shows the rebound of some of the support that we've seen which is indicative of what other toll agencies have seen as facilities have been in operation a little while. Uh, people start to understand how they work. They're more educated on the protocols and the requirements for them. And they, maybe they've used it a couple times to understand the value of, of what the project brings. So we're happy to see that rebounding. And we think that that question of people like having to, that option indicates uh, that we're, we're turning the corner on acceptance. A couple other surveys that we did also in the summer of express toll lane customers and express toll lane business users where, that we got from looking at our account holders that had business names with them, on them. And so we asked another question, should they be extended? Should the express toll lanes be extended from Renton to Bellevue? Our customers, 57% 50, were in support of that extension and over upwards of 60% supported the extension to Renton to, or down to Renton. So we thought that was a great indicator of support for not only their existing in Bellevue to Linwood, but also extending them south. Uh, this is the performance metric, one of the two performance metrics that were measured uh, upon uh, in the legislation that authorizes the express toll lanes. Many of you are already familiar with this. I've talked about it quite a bit uh, in the two year anniversary uh, as it's come and gone. <clears throat> and that is uh, 45 miles per hour, 90% of the time in the express toll lanes. And so what the graphic on the left shows you is Bellevue to Linwood chunked up into four pieces, the dual lane sections at the bottom and the single lane sections on the top. You notice that the dual lane sections do quite well, uh, 96 and 94%, uh, 45 miles per hour or greater. And I should, I should point out that this is the six month reporting period, the last six months uh, of the two year uh, reporting period between April and September. So this was the reporting period that you heard a lot about in, in the two year anniversary and this is what we've been reporting since. So dual lane section 96 and 94 percent doing well. The single lane section in the northbound direction notice that's at 94 percent. So that's a great improvement that's been brought upon by the PQ shoulder that opened in April. So that really raised the performance of the single lane section and so what remains in what's pulling down the overall average that we report that you hear about is the southbound single lane section. So you see that's at 63%. That's uh, sort of a victim of its own success in the morning. It's very popular. It fills up very early in the morning and we hit $10 toll rates very, very often. So uh, when you take the four sections in aggregate, and this is a number that you may have heard, we get 45 miles per hour, 85% of the time. And that's the speedometer you see in the lower right hand corner there. Uh, so you can see where the real problem is in the southbound single lane section, but we're having good performance in the other three sections as well. Another thing that uh, we like to point out is that the HOV lane in, these, in this section, both directions uh, measured the same way. Uh, we're performing at 45 miles per hour only 56% of the time. So a market improvement up to 85% since the Bellevue to Linwood project opened. Uh, this is the revenue slide. The other metric that we're measured upon is do the express toll lanes generate enough revenue to cover operations and maintenance? Uh, clearly it does. Again, this is the September 30th number, so this would be in two years in operation. As of September, $44.5 million uh, was generated by the Bellevue to Linwood project. 15.7 uh, was used for operation and maintenance, and the rest was uh, will be reinvested or was already reinvested. 11.5 million of that toll revenue was reinvested in the PQ shoulder, already providing benefit that I just described. 
and then 17.3 million um, already are still there to be reinvested in the 405 corridor. Uh, and since September, and now there is more money uh, beyond 44.5 million, of course, that is there to be reinvested. Okay, Kim, I think you're up. Um, so one of the things that uh, um, Ed was just talking about was we're not meeting the, the, the speed requirement that was outlined in the legislation. And, um, and because of that, we've heard from a lot of folks that maybe we should go back to a single lane HOV lane. So we, we thought, you know, maybe it would be a good idea to do some comparisons of single lanes versus the dual express toll lane. What does that operation really look like? Uh, we've certainly done a lot of modeling. I'll talk about some of the modeling, but we've also heard from folks about, well, how do you know that your model is really accurate or not? And so that's where we thought we'd go out and do some comparisons between some similar sections of I-5 to similar sections of 405. Um, and so what we have here is a comparison with I-5 over on the left-hand side of the screen and 405 on, on the right-hand side of the screen. And in both cases, we have five lane sections of roadway. So with I-5, we have a single HOV lane and four general purpose lanes. And then on 405, we have uh, the two express toll lanes and three general purpose lanes. And then we took the cross section, which is the little graphic right above, uh, right, right above the, the picture there. And we color coded that to show what the current operation is on the roadway. And as we were doing this calculation, we really re went back and reviewed a whole year worth of data to make sure we had a good representative average day. And we wanted to also focus in on, on representative average days that were at the same time frame. And so we, we selected um, July in, in both cases here. And then we took videos of those average days out there on the roadway. We've also done this at different times of the year, uh, once again, trying to focus on comparisons and we get the same results uh, regardless of what we're looking at. But as, as we did that, we also were picking locations where we have the same amount of daily traffic. And so uh, at the I-5 location at 130th, we have 105 uh, daily trips through there and on uh, 405 we have 107 so um, for all practical purposes they they are identical in terms of volume and so as we look at the the video on i5 and you look at what's happening on the i5 hov lane you can see that that bus is really not moving any faster than any of the other cars on the freeway and and that's what we see on a typical day through this particular section so we're not getting great speed and throughput but if we look at 405 you can see the express toll lane is actually moving very well and because there's enough cars that are actually moving and not parked uh, we're getting other cars out of the general purpose flow, so we're actually getting some pretty good uh, movement or better movement on the general purpose lanes than, than what we saw on um, I-5. And so we continued to look at some other locations. We picked another location on I-5 as well as another location on 405, and we compared what was happening during the peak hour. And so we have the two locations for I-5 on the left side of this bar graph, um, and then the, the 2405 on, on the right-hand side. And when you look at those volumes, both are five-lane sections, and yet we're getting about 35% more traffic through on 405 than we do on I-5. So that's, uh, I think, is, is a pretty good example of what happens when you actually get traffic moving. Uh, you prevent the stop and go traffic. You don't have the parking lot where nobody's getting through, but when you keep traffic moving, you just get more volume through and you maximize the efficiency of the roadway. We also took a look at, so what happens when we compare the number of people that are in, in the, the vehicles, and we put that bar right beside the volume bar. So if we just look at person throughput, uh, as you can see, it pretty much uh, replicates the, the same trend overall. We're getting more people through on, on 405 as well. Um, in this particular example, we didn't really uh, dive into bus volumes and, and the number of passengers on buses. We were just looking at, at carpool volumes and the number of people per car. 
Um, so we also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, have modeled what uh, happens if we do look at going back to just a, a, a single HOV lane throughout the corridor. And so we've uh, put together some uh, congestion contours or heat maps to show where the, the problem areas are. And so uh, on the very far left-hand side of this, uh, this shows the corridor and where we are within the corridor. So at the very top of, of those sets of lines, we see I-5. And then as you travel down the page, uh, you work your way towards downtown Bellevue at the very bottom. And so that's the length of the corridor. And so as you go across any of these charts here, you can pick out whatever location you'd like to, whether it's 522 or 520 or whatever location, and you can see what's going on in that particular area. And you can see that time is across the bottom. So this is the morning peak period, and we're going between 5 a.m. and 11 a.m. And so uh, the first two are existing conditions. We have general purpose lanes, and then we have right next to it the express toll lanes. Uh, green is the free flow condition, uh, and then as we go through the various colors, black is a stop and go, and so that's the, really the, the, the color we're trying to avoid. And as you start at the top of the page and you travel down through uh, the, the current configuration uh, on the general purpose lanes, you'll see that we really have a lot of congestion until we get through the Highway 522 interchange area. Then we get a break and we've got more congestion coming through uh, Kirkland area before we get into downtown Bellevue. Uh, right next to it is the express toll lane. And so as Ed was talking earlier about the problems we're having during the morning performance, uh, you can see where that area is. And we do have uh, some congestion uh, occurring in and around uh, the, the morning peak, the worst of it at about 7 a.m. Um, then we modeled what happens if we took that uh, express toll lane and just converted it back to a two plus HOV lane. And those are the next two charts over. And because we are no longer preventing the stop and go, we've got a, a lot of traffic crowding into the HOV lane in the north end. Uh, we see that we really have a, a much more congested situation. Uh, we actually have a lot of traffic spilling back through the 405 I-5 interchange area onto I-5, and so we're creating even more congestion back onto I-5. Uh, and as you look across the top of the page there, you can see that um, it actually goes well beyond the, the 11 a.m. cutoff that we ran our model till. And so uh, we've got many more hours of congestion, and we have a really pretty solid bottleneck all the way down through the Highway 522 interchange. Um, same thing is true with the HOV lane. We are not getting any, uh, because we're not uh, managing the flow of traffic, uh, that is breaking down as well. Uh, so we also have the same bottleneck area uh, through the Highway 522 area. Once we get past that, we have then the added capacities that are already out there, and so then things start to move pretty well. If you are south of Highway 522, you actually are gonna get a pretty good trip. Uh, but if you were coming out of Snohomish County, uh, trying to get down into the Bellevue area, um, you're really gonna be stuck in some very, very severe congestion. So this has really made things much worse, not better. And I think, you know, really what our focus is is how to make things better. Um, we also took a look, because it's been suggested, why don't we just do a single hot lane? And so we also modeled that one as well. So we're getting uh, some management of the lanes, and we've put that together here. And if you look at the right-hand side, it's better than the last one, uh, but we still are worse than existing conditions. So once again, that didn't help us solve anything. Uh, we do have some spill back on I-5, not nearly as bad for as uh, extended a period of time, but we still get uh, the extra trips backing up onto I-5. Um, and so the other important piece with this one is because people are still going to be paying the $10 tolls in the single lane section in the north end, that lane's going to be full. By the time you get down into the Kirkland area, that lane is still full, and it's a single lane. Very few people have gotten out between 522 and downtown Bellevue. And so if there is room to get in, those are still going to be very high tolls, equivalent to the, the tolls in the north end. So contrary to what we're trying to do, uh, uh, reduce uh, the congestion and reduce tolls, we're, we're keeping in some very high tolls and made congestion worse here. 
So we've also heard uh, from our, our transit partners uh, about the performance that they've seen on uh, the express toll lanes and from community transit. Uh, they are finding that they are getting better travel times, better trips through the corridor. Uh, but as they compared that to what's been, they've experienced on I-5 with the continued growth that we've seen throughout the region, the continued congestion, they actually are having to spend more money for the same number of trips because buses are stuck in, in congestion longer. And so rather than spending those dollars on in, improved uh, transit services, they're just trying to maintain the service that they have at a higher cost every year. Uh, we've heard similar uh, statements from uh, King County Metro where they've also been looking at their various bus routes uh, on I-5 and then comparing them to how they operate on 405. And in terms of sound transit, uh, they put their ST3 plan together with an expectation that express toll lanes were going to be there to provide the, the high reliability and the high speed trips that they need so that bus rapid transit can really operate like a high capacity transit system should operate. So if we went backwards and, and took the express toll lanes out, we would see overall uh, traffic performance uh, go downhill. Uh, there would also be significant impacts to transit reliability. Um, but then we also have the revenue source that, that Ed talked about earlier that's going to uh, help with some of the improvements that, that are needed here in the corridor and those would disappear. Um, so I want to talk just a, a minute about some of the projects that we have uh, underway right now and these are um, important in that we've set our schedule of projects up uh, throughout the length of the corridor so we're down in, in Renton on the one end and then all the way up uh, through Kirkland area here with projects that we want to have completed by 2024. And the reason we want to have those complete by 2024 is that's when Sound Transit plans to bring bus rapid transit online here within the corridor. So we want our infrastructure to be in place uh, to allow bus rapid transit to operate. And so one of the projects that's uh, close, closer to, uh, to Bothell here is in the, the Totem Lake area. Uh, we are putting in a, a half diamond interchange to and from the, the north. And uh, one of the reasons that um, I think it's uh, uh, of interest here to the city of Bothell is um, the close proximity or the, the proximity that the new interchange will provide and access it'll provide uh, to the Kingsgate Park and Ride Lot. So uh, as we look at this particular picture, this is a, a drawing of the new interchange that we're going to have. And, and so to the top of the page is the north side and to the bottom is the south side. And so if you, you look uh, at the intersection roundabout um, on the, the left side here of the interchange, you can see there's a parking area, that's the Kingsgate Park and Ride. And so that's gonna be fairly easy access from trips coming uh, out of the north to get off here and, and access transit in this particular area. And then it's a fairly easy trip to get back out as well. Um, so in addition to the access that we have at 128th, which is an inside uh, direct access uh, interchange, we'll also now have this one that's gonna provide access to the area. Um, a project that we have in construction right now today uh, down in Renton is the, the 45167 interchange. Uh, I don't know if anybody drives that far south, uh, but this uh, flyover ramp here is gonna connect the 167 hot lanes to the, the new express toll lanes on 405. And so it goes from the inside of Highway 167 to the inside of 405, so northbound to northbound and then southbound to southbound which means nobody's gonna to have to weave all the way across the freeway to, to get to the, the ramps on the outside if you happen to be in the, the HOV lane or, or the uh, hot lane down there. Um, this project is moving along very well. Um, we are currently under budget and a little bit ahead of schedule, so we're hoping that uh, days like this will continue throughout the winter and we'll be able to uh, maintain that ahead of schedule um, that we're, we're currently working on. Um, the rest of the project um, connects then from Highway 167 all the way up into downtown Bellevue, adding one lane each direction. That new lane in each direction is gonna be coupled with the HOV lane to create the, the dual lane express toll lane. And so that's the, the completion of that missing link. 
And one of the most important things is that as we have total revenue coming in here from the north end, but also then Renton to Bellevue comes online, uh, we start forecasting what that toll revenue means, uh, we can see that over time it can really make a, a difference in terms of some of the projects that we need to deliver here. The purple line on this uh, forecast represents the tolls that are coming in from 405 and, and really as you see the, the direction of that line changing, that's as the whole corridor comes online. We also have Highway 167 hotlines uh, forecasted with the green line and, and the most important piece is the the top bullet up there, the, the nearly $500 million in, in net toll revenue by about 2030. And so we need some of that funds to complete Renton to Bellevue, but that leaves a lot of money that can be focused here in the 522 to 527 area. Um, so with that, we've been, we have money from the legislature for engineering. Uh, we've been working on plans between Highway 522 and 527, um, making some pretty good progress with that. But we're also a little bit concerned uh, with the timing of when the funds will become available here for that. And so right now today, we've been planning on a pay as you go. So collect toll revenue and we get enough toll revenue, then we can build the next phase of projects. And with that sort of strategy, we've concluded, you know, the highest priority need is the southbound direction. And with that southbound direction, we could get started right away. And so we laid out a schedule, which is really at the very bottom down here, the phase delivery. But it says we could get started in 2024 and we could build southbound capacity through the Highway 522 interchange and address the, the problems that we're having there. And then we come back and complete the rest of the project in phase 1B. Um, so that would start in 2031. We've also heard from a lot of people that that's not nearly good enough. It's not soon enough. The problem exists today. And so we really need to solve the problem today. Um, there's been a lot of interest in, in that particular issue. And so um, we are continuing to look at how we can do that. In, and we're looking at that uh, through uh, different uh, bonding strategies and working with the state treasurer on that. Um, just to give everybody a sense of what that's going to look like, um, this is a, just a, a view of the, the phasing for the new interchange and the thing that we would do to get started here is build a new northbound bridge and so um, that is just to the east of the existing bridges and that means the two existing bridges are now freed up both of those for southbound travel and so we can now put uh, southbound travel on the northbound and that's how we get the capacity through the interchange. Then we come back with a second phase and complete a direct access in and out of the express toll lanes uh, from Highway 522 and complete the rest of the interchange. So um, this is a, a, a fly through of what that interchange would look like when it gets built. Um, and so this is just part of our engineering drawing. So everything that's uh, just in the, the fuzzy green stuff is are things outside of, of the engineering drawing. So don't pay any attention to, to green or, or mountains that don't seem right because they're just fill-ins uh, for the, the actual model. Um, but we'll see that you can actually um, get an idea of what things are gonna look like. The bright green is where the new roadways are, the new ramps that are being reconstructed. And so in a, as you go through the three-dimensional view, you can see um, how things are, are going to look. So the, as we come down, we have the, the new ramp connections. And uh, as we come into this first intersection here, we have a northbound off-ramp on the left-hand side, uh, as well as then um, we have a eastbound to northbound ramp on the right-hand side. Uh, this bridge we're going under right here with uh, the green girders uh, is the new northbound direction. As you look to the left-hand side, you can see where the new uh, ramps to and from the, the Kirkland Bellevue area would be for the direct access. And then these are the two existing bridges that we have out there today. And then uh, as we get uh, further along here, you're gonna see a parking garage off on the, the right-hand side. Um, that is a 
park and ride lot that we have been uh, thinking would fit well in uh, the space within the interchange, so we've been planning for it, uh, but it is not part of either Sound Transit's plan or funded by WashDOT at this point. We're just simply trying to plan for the intersections designs to accommodate up to a thousand cars in this particular area. And so um, we'll just showing what could be done here as opposed to what is currently funded or planned. And then at the other end of the set of improvements up at Canyon Park, uh, we have a, a direct access in and out of the express toll lanes. Uh, this is very similar to the direct access we have in downtown Bellevue. Um, and so buses would be able to, or carpools, uh, be able to exit here. We have the Canyon Park Park and Ride. Uh, and so uh, this is how we would end one lane and then a uh, single lane would continue on. Uh, our master plan eventually calls for um, more improvements through the area and our next step is to, to get dual lanes up to I-5 uh, as well as uh, general purpose capacity improvements, but this is the, the next plan step. So as we worked with uh, the state treasurer, uh, we have so far um, looked at what could be done with the toll revenue that's coming in today. And so with that, uh, we have under our current law assumptions, we have a $10 cap, we're just working off of that and a 25 year uh, debt service. And so when we looked at just um, using strictly toll revenue to pay back the bonds, um, we could only get about uh, $76.5 million uh, worth of bond proceeds uh, to be used. But if we, we looked at a triple backed, uh, so that we're looking at uh, both the toll revenue, uh, the motor vehicle fuel tax, as well as the good faith and credit of the state, then we can get nearly 200 million. Uh, I've been asked uh, by uh, some legislators to uh, take a, a, a broader look at what toll revenues could be used. And so we're going through those exercises uh, as well with the state treasurer now to take a look at the whole corridor um, and see what could be generated out of, out of that and see where, what possible uh, solutions we could come up with. Um, as part of the ongoing conversations, we've just been getting a, an awful lot of support for the, the, the next steps and particularly a lot of this information has been passed on to the legislature. Um, we did get uh, a letter of support to the legislature that, that came out of Snohomish County Committee for Improved Transportation back in December. Then uh, in January of this year, our executive advisory group all got together and signed a, a letter of support uh, as well as then just very recently here, um, the, the North I-405 stakeholders group uh, came together with a, uh, a pretty substantial list of, of signatures for support. And I think a, a lot of that work came uh, right here out of, uh, out of the, the city of Bothell. And, and so I think all of that information has, has been very significant for um, helping us pull together and understand the level of support and for the legislature as well to then consider what the next steps might be. So with that, if there's any questions. Councilman Ragney. Well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think we all uh, know that we need a uh, little help northbound and southbound on 405 between I-5 and Bothell. I, uh, Mr. Berry, I got a question for you on tolling. Yeah. How, uh, how does it go up when more vehicles access it? Does it go up by 10 cents, by 25 cents, or? It's in increments based on the congestion as, as the morning peak goes on. There's loops in the roadway, both as toll lanes and in the general purpose lanes. So the, the algorithm that updates every five minutes can see um, that the congestion is building and it can go up quite quickly if it needs to, uh, but can go up more slowly if it has to. You know, I was asking that because I was driving on 167 the other day and it was 57 cents. Uh, and, I, and I said, that's odd. I've never seen 57 that cents. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good, good catch. That is an indicator of, uh, that we're showing default rates and we're having issues with our systems. <laughs> and so I've been lobbying that we can get a better way of notifying ourselves of that and uh, have been so far unsuccessful. But that, that is a mistake and we, we learn to correct that as quickly as we can. I appreciate it. I, I use the, what are 
being called the Lexus Lanes all the time now. Thank you. You're welcome. Deputy Mayor. Thank you so much for the presentation. A lot of that was um, review for me, but because I'm on the EAG, I did want to ask a couple questions um, because this is kind of a learning process for some new people on council. Um, I wondered if you knew at this point which changes um, that were recommended by the University of Minnesota that you might be pursuing and if you could maybe give a little update on that. Uh, sure, sure. Um, so we're curr currently putting together a work plan on our responses to all of those uh, recommendations. Uh, some of the near-term things that we're looking at is the algorithm and being more predictive. Uh, we're already in test mode for some of those. Uh, I mentioned that uh, updating the algorithm every five minutes, we're looking at updating it every three minutes uh, to make it more predictive. We're also looking at other parameters associated with the predictive nature of the algorithm. We're testing some of those right now. So these are things that we were considering before the findings came out, but now that they've come out and we're, we're trying to speed those along and bring those into fruition faster. So we're looking at that. Um, some of the other recommendations were expanding capacity. Uh, Kim touched on that and some of the, the legislative work that he's doing. Uh, looking at segmentation and uh, more open access, that's gonna require more study. We're putting together work plans to see if there's any um, any value or any uh, progress that we can make with those. So those are a little more long-term that we're looking at. And then uh, the, uh, the other one uh, having to do with the, the $10 cap, that's a commission uh, purview. So um, we're in conversations with the commission, but we're not anticipating, I think as the university said, we're not anticipating in raising the cap right now. We're looking at what other fruit can be gained or what other things can be gained by some of the other recommendations. Uh, and I think the other ones were increased transit. Now transit's gonna talk about some of the BRT in there. So um, I guess the, the long story I said, the short story is, is we're, we have a work plan to look at that, but the more near term stuff is the algorithm that we're really focusing on. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to thank Kim particularly because we've been talking for two years now. <laughs> And I've, I've given you a really hard time, um, but you have stepped up and you you've I know you've worked really hard to try to put this plan together. And um, hopefully our letter will help um, getting some funding from the legislature. So um, thanks for all your efforts, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, um, and we certainly uh, recognize the, the need that we have up here. And so, you know, the sooner I think that we can solve that need, the, the, the better for everybody, and that's our interest. Councilmember McAuliffe. Thank you, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I know that this was a pilot project for 405, and that the two elements that had to be um, uh, decided was um, the 45 mile an hour kind of rate that it, the traffic was to move at, and the revenue collected. So from what I've heard, we are not yet at the 45 mile per hour rate, is that correct? Um, that's correct. And then, so the legislature, will they decide whether to move forward or make a decision about what the pilot should have shown and its value? So I, I think right now the, the legislature um, has, has made a determination that uh, the way it, the language was written, um, that, uh, we're meeting the letter of the, the law in terms of they only had to meet one, and, and oh. so if both were failing, then they had to do something, sure. but if only one was failing, then they didn't necessarily have to do something. And when they look at the way the HOV lane system was performing previously compared to the way it's performing now, which is much, much better, and then as we went through the, the, the different uh, scenarios we looked at in terms of conversion back, which are even, much worse with all the growth we've had in the area. I think uh, everybody's interested in how do we go forward and solve the problem, and so let's fix what, where we're having that problem, which is that area between uh, 522 and 527. Right. So that's the, the direction we're going at this point. Thank you very much. Councilmember McNeil. Thank you, thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned the parking possible park parking structure with a thousand, did you say a thousand cars? Um, yes, correct. Okay. And, uh, and that's based on intersection capacities there, and so we were just trying to say what, 
what could we make work in this location? And so that's the number we came up with. Okay, so it's anticipated a need of about a thousand parking stalls in that area. Is, is that correct assumption? Yes. Okay, and then the the projects at the 522 and the 527 Kenyon Park area, those two projects, does that anticipate the growth beyond 2031, 2040? Does that anticipate the growth that we're hearing in 2050? Um, so we're looking out to um, 2040 uh, in terms of our projections, and, and uh, um, which is typical to have a 20-year design horizon. Um, and so as we get updated information, though, on population and employment forecasts, we do incorporate those into our model. It's just only how far out can we, even 20 years is, is somewhat um, difficult to, to get those numbers, and so we start looking 30 and 40. We have some information, and we use that, um, but you know our confidence goes downhill. Yeah, because I'm not sure which committee it was. I was just sitting in a recent committee where we heard it's gonna, by 2050, should be a million eight new residents here in, in our area, regionally. Um, and you had mentioned 170,000 um, in this area with 150,000 new applicants for driver's licenses. So thinking ahead proactively, I'm wondering, if we're designing this for today's needs. Are we truly designing it for today's needs only or are we designing it for future needs as well? Um, one, of the, one of the nice things uh, about express toll lanes is that, um, you know, I, I, with the, the management of the facility, uh, once we get the capacity in place and we get uh, the, the BRT in place and the connections, you know, I think we're going to see that that's going to be a, a long-term solution. Is the master plan adequate for 2040, 2050? I think we definitely will have to go back at some point in time and rethink the entire master plan for the corridor. Uh, but right now today, we're really focused on how do we get the, the major components of the master plan done that are needed now, and then let's come back and refocus on what are the next steps that we need to do for the corridor here. And these designs, do you feel confident that these designs would allow for addition to them? Me meaning that when we build a road to nowhere, can we add on to that road, right? Yes. So, so as much as we can, we ab we absolutely try to do that. And so okay. if we were looking at Canyon Park, for example, we were showing the connection that goes towards a Canyon Park park and ride. Um, we also have developed plans and strategies for how do we make that a cross connection of both directions of 405. I think the, the second area, second direction is going to be a little more challenging over time, um, but we need to probably get there at some point. So. We need to plan today for what that would look like somewhere down the road so that we can continue those next steps. Fabulous, thank you. Councilmember Zorns. Okay, so I will confess that I have watched your presentation before I was on city council, but I'm coming at my questions or comments with you know a good measure of ignorance, so I appreciate your patience with me. Um, one, um, when I look at this, the daughter of an engineer looks at this and goes, there was a lot of work that went in to put this together and, and run the data through. Um, but I have, you know, some questions came to mind like uh, the survey that you cited on page nine, it would have been nice to survey everybody who uses the freeway to get what their opinion is about the toll lane. So I look at that and I think, well, that's kind of skewed. That's for the people basically who are using it and what their feelings are on that, um, which I'm stating the obvious, right? So, and then I was looking at uh, page 13 where you were doing some comparisons, which I thought really cool idea to compare I-5 usage and 405 usage about the same time of day, same number of cars, and then my question was, but what are the on dynamics of the on-ramps and off-ramps? Are they comparable to where they're placed on those sections? Do you know off the top of your head? 
Um, yes, yeah, so we actually spent a lot of time selecting the locations so that we had similar types of, of traffic. Um, there was many locations that, that we discounted because of upstream or downstream bottlenecks that, that influenced the flow. And so we were looking for sections that had a, a typical flow of traffic. Um, and, and so it, it wasn't just randomly that, that we ended up with those sections and we weren't necessarily trying to pick um, one place that was good on 405 versus a place that was bad on I-5. Um, and we did a, a lot of data review to, to get to that point. So when you say flow of traffic, you mean not just flowing north or flowing south, but the percentage of cars that are trying to move across either into a commuter lane or transit lane or to get on or off the freeway, those that also figured into flow dynamics? Yes. Okay. And so an on-ramp can really have a, a significant impact on traffic flow depending upon the, the volume of the on-ramp and, and the location. Right. Uh, we tried to find a number of locations in the South King County area, uh, but because of all the construction that was going on, for example, down in, in downtown Tacoma area, um, that traffic was backing up and just influencing the traffic right. flow. And so while we could find five lane sections, they weren't the same they, they were just being influenced by other factors outside of that roadway section. Okay. And, and, and my last thing is a comment that you probably have heard, and, but I'm just going to throw out the notion of the uh, train going across on 90, that, that there is a lot of buzz that I don't know if reaches you, that the, the dollars that are going in to fund that, the design and the building of that, when it has issues of dynamics of water going up and down and side to side, um, would would probably pay pretty significantly for other needs like park and rides and that sort of thing. So if that is ever on the table and you have a chance to voice an opinion that the public might be interested in just trains that are going north and south and not east and west, I think, I think you would find that that would resonate with a lot of people. That's just my only comment. I'll, uh, I'll leave that one for our transit partners here to 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 talk about. Um, but uh, if you'd like to go back uh, and talk about how the surveys were done, we could certainly talk about that a little bit more. Ed's probably more closely involved than, than I was, um, but we did include both users and non-users of the express toll lanes, and, and so um, as part of that, we were trying to reach as broad an audience as we can could, and we did do three separate types of, of surveys to try and get that. And with each audience, we got very similar types of responses. How, how did you, can I ask how you got the, you know, how did you pick your non-users? I mean, I, I'm assuming your users are sitting in your database, uh, you know, people who are using it, but how did you flag and identify your non-users? Because I don't remember ever hearing about a chance to participate in the survey. Was that direct contact? No, I think we, we hired a consultant to do an online survey to reach uh, not only drivers of 405 in, in certain demographics that we had up and down the freeway. So we used an online survey company to go out and reach out to those users. Okay, so but you don't know what that populate who that population was, that, they were, how they, they got that inform they were how they how they came sampled the, it. these these companies go out and they go out and find certain demographics that that we need to find, to get to, and that's what we paid them to do. And they were not only good to go account users, which we know who they are, as you mentioned, right. but these are four or five drivers who use the corridor and don't necessarily use the express lanes either, because you don't necessarily have to be a good to go account user to use the express toll lines. You can use it and get billed pay by mail as well. Okay. Okay. I, I guess I would like to see this study itself and sure, instead sure of grilling have. you yeah. on it. Sure. So thank we've you. got lots of information. We okay, thanks. And the last one. Um, I have a few questions. So one of them I'll, I'll just because that was just asked. The uh, pay by mail I heard that the people that do the pay by mail are paying the the majority of the total toll revenues. Is that true? No. It's so it's usually people that have an actual pass that are paying more toll revenues. 
or I mean, I, grand I'm not total. sure the exact breakdown, but it's it's not the majority is not paid by mail. We have lots of good to go account users on 405. Okay, I was just curious when I heard that. I was like, wow, that. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, I always call that an idiot fee. If uh, yeah, anyways, oh, okay, so. Then you, on page slide 25, you had I-405 State Route 167. Uh, said that there's going to be approximately a billion by 2040. So one of the things I heard when you were building the toll lanes is that once those were built, the revenues would be used, and people were upset because they were going to be used to build the Bellevue to Renton uh, toll lanes. Is that true or not true? Um, so the corridor is defined as all of... 405 and the way the legislation is set up is that money that's generated in 405 can be used within 405. The way it happens to work is that just by coincidence, um, it's more or less a 50-50 split between the revenue that's getting generated in the north end and the revenue that's getting generated in the south end. So when you look at that amount of money, about half of it can be used in the north and about half can be used in, in the south end. Um, I been, I've personally always been pushing back a little bit on, on sort of the, the sub-area equity question here within the corridor because it, you need the whole corridor to operate and you need it to operate as efficiently as possible. And if we needed some money to come out of the south end to solve the north end problems, then we should do that and as we should do the other as well. And so um, I, over time, um, there's going to be more revenue generated out of the south half of the corridor. It's just the way uh, the demand forecasts are, are predicting right now. And so um, we want to be able to use that money within the corridor, I think, in, in, in that way. You're going to get about half of it uh, up here right now, and they'll get about half down there. But over time, we're going to have different uh, bottleneck locations developed that are going to become our next priority that we need to use the funds that are available within the corridor. But no funds out of 405 can be used anywhere else. And um, at, at some point in time, I've heard some people say, I thought I heard something about using them somewhere else. And by state law, they have to be used here in this corridor. So I guess that's where I'm confused then. Because like the, so you said you the preliminary office of the state treasurer's financial analysis, you said about 10 mil with the $10 toll cap by, I don't know what year you're kind of referring to, but if you were kind of waiting for the cash to build up, if you will, you would be waiting a long time, basically. It's kind of what I got out of what you were saying. Is that? Right. So if we're waiting for strictly for the, the cash to build up and do a, a pay-as-you-go sort of thing without any bonding, the first phase of project could start in 2024. If we bonded strictly against the revenue that's coming in today, and, and started uh, construction as quickly as possible. Um, that's where I think it was the 74.5 million and the 200 million came into play. And so that was just bonding this portion of the revenue stream and did not account for what was happening between Renton and Bellevue. And so okay. those funds would still be available without having to be dedicated to paying off bonds. And so they could still be used throughout the corridor. I, so I, I guess where I'm headed is, couldn't we use some of that billion dollars by 2020 in the south section of 405 to build those projects sooner in the north end? So the the rent to Bellevue piece is the the next priority within the the corridor, and it's it's really um, under construction with the first project now, and the the next ones are coming, um, and and so. That priority is is really underway and and going, and so then, um, if the legislature chose to um, defer some some something associated with that, that would have to be a decision from the legislature. We actually have that project set up as three particular three separate contracts, and and there and so the first two are really I th I think in, on track right now today. They could choose on the third one to. Um, do something different with that, uh, but that would have to be a choice coming from the legislature. No, I'm okay with building that thing down there because then you'd get a billion dollars by 2060. What I what I want to know because we use that money when it starts coming in from the Renton, the Bellevue to Renton piece to start paying for those projects up here. Yes. Okay. And so that's the 10 million. So, but that's all within legislature's approval. They need to decide where the money's going to go. 
And so, yes, that money can come here. Okay. So let's say we sh totally shut down the toll lanes. How much money will there be to fix the issues that we're having between uh, 522 and uh, I-5 or, yeah, I-5? Um, so if there are no express toll lanes, then there there will only be the money that we've got today in, um, wh what's that, about 30? As of September 17. 17 million. Is, we've Doesn't collected a few more since then, a few more dollars since since September, but yeah, we're not, we're, it's not a lot of funds. Put some gravel down on the shoulders or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I had one more back this way. Oh, it was your, it was on slide 10 the, for the revenues. So when they built the first section of the toll lanes out here on North 405, did they have money cash in hand or are we paying debt service on the first phase? Um, no, everything was uh, has been paid for uh, at cash on hand. So we, there is no debt service associated with any of the projects to date. Is that common in the, that you guys don't bond for the projects like throughout all your state projects? So when I say don't bond, we've bonded against the gas tax. Uh, so the state legislature has bonded the gas tax, but we've not bonded against toll revenues. Um, and and so that's the, the, the piece we haven't done yet. Bond, <laughs> please, <laughs> and fix, a, fix 405. <laughs> In our area, I mean, so if you bonded, how, what year are we talking about realistically? Let's say they say, okay, let's do it, and then you bond, and when are we gonna start seeing improvements to 405? Well, with the, the work we've done so far with the state treasurer, if we bonded against the, the current uh, toll revenue that we have, we get started um, with uh, the southbound direction. By the time we get engineering done uh, and ready to go to construction, it would be 2021, and it'd be complete by 2024. Um, so the, I, I think the, the other question that's being asked is, is there a way to include the northbound piece within that same contract work and do both northbound and southbound at the same time? And that's the work that we're currently doing with the state treasurer. If you need any, need any help, will you please give me a call with the legislature? I'd be happy to go down there and, and talk to them about it because this is a big issue for us up here. Um, we, and we certainly recognize that, and um, uh, we'll continue to be talking about that over the course of the, this next year as how, how's, how are we going to move forward and what's the next steps. You guys can't call us, can you, to come down there? Um, so the deputy mayor is on our executive advisory group, okay. um, and um, she is constantly advocating for the, those next steps. and. I think as a, as a group, our executive advisory group, really carries a lot of weight with the legislature. Uh, I think that they have acted on every recommendation from our group, and so I think that's a, a good opportunity uh, to uh, get, get your perspectives down to the legislature. And, of course, however, as a city, you want to uh, communicate with the legislature as well. Okay, cool. Oh, you want to go second round? Mm -hmm. You guys want to do a second round of questions of Washington? Could you just, uh, because of OPMA, I haven't actually discussed our stakeholder letter with the rest of council. So maybe if you could just, that's obviously part of our advocating for the changes. So I just thought I'd give you the opportunity to say um, what that does and how that helps you. Um, so, um, one of the things that, that I, I've heard from legislative leadership is that our executive advisory group um, really uh, shows that there is uh, a, a lot of support throughout the, the length of the corridor. And so that's why they have always uh, taking recommendations from that group um, uh, as, as uh, pretty significant support for any next steps. And uh, with this particular uh, set of, of problems that we have up here, with the extra letters of support that we are getting. Um, it has been, I think, uh, very helpful for the state legislature to see that it's not just our, our group of uh, electeds, but there are others out there as well. And so 
with uh, the North End 405 Stakeholders Group as well as with the SCIT Group. There's businesses associated uh, that are signing on in support of that. Um, and I think that really carries a lot of weight. So there are, are cities, um, counties, elected officials uh, from, from um, those groups, uh, also legislators signing on uh, with the 405 stakeholder group, um, as well as a number of businesses uh, that stepped up and, and said they supported this project when they've not been part of the ongoing conversation, which I think just shows the, the, the depth of, of interest in, in taking that next step. And so I, I think the legislature's um, very interested in, in, all the, in that information that they're getting in support of, and it just shows the broad base uh, support that everybody has up here for it. It's always good when you don't have something controversial and everybody's agreeing it's the right way to go forward on the, on the next steps in the project. Any other questions, Councilman Reagan? I have a question for you. It, it, and when the mayor asked you about funding and was the North End money going down to Renton to help build those hot lanes or you, you stated that 50% of the revenue comes from the South End and 50% comes from the North End on, on the 405 corridor. Well, how can you get 50% if you're not tolling down there? Um, so they will be start tolling in, in 2024, and so the, the figure I was referring to was by 2030. And so there's a, f there's a, a significant amount of, of funds being generated in, in that six-year period. Um, and so that was the, the number I was referring to, and that's a very rough 50-50. It, it, it could be uh, slightly off from 50-50, but it's in that ballpark. And are the uh, lanes going to be capped at ten dollars from Renton or from Bellevue to Renton? So the same rules as, as there as we have up here will apply to Renton to Bellevue. Um, the Transportation Commission might choose to change some rule at some point, but whatever they do, we'll have the exact same rules of the road no matter what section of 405 you're on. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Need to shave. <laughs> Seeing none. All right, we're on to the next. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Thank you coming you. out. Thank you. So before uh, Paul comes up from Sound Transit, I also wanted to mention that uh, Roland Behe from Community Transit is also here. He's not presenting this evening, but if you have questions for Community Transit as we go through the evening, he's he's here to respond. So, Paul. Great, uh, fantastic, thank you. I'm glad to be here again. My name is Paul Cornish, I'm the VRT Project Director, and there's three of us presenting tonight, Cynthia Padilla and Kathleen Yoda will be coming up later as we go through these three topics tonight, which is an overview of the high capacity transit system, which I will be doing. And we did a lot of this a while back, but I understand there's three new council members, so congratulations on, on your new, new roles, and also congratulations on now being part of the BRT team. We're also gonna go through the status of the 522 BRT 405, and then some needs and opportunities <laughs> in Bothell. And one thing, I like, I'm really glad that Cynthia and Kathy are here today because of some of the common elements, such as the, the architecture, Cynthia will be leading that effort. Another common element is looking at the type of buses we'll be using for the BRT, including looking at the propulsion system, possibly an all-electric bus. Kathy's leading that effort. And these are two elements that are, I think, going to be a very important um, interest to you and your constituents. And so I'm pleased that they're able to be here today. You can see, you can put their faces to their names as we move forward, because they will be very um, active in the community as we move forward. So as Henry was alluding to, it's always great to, to follow Kim because he, he has lots of great information to share. We're looking at about 1,500 people moving to Puget Sound every week, which translates to freeway delays up to 95% the last couple of years. I looked at our slide and I looked at his slide with all the colors and the people and the cars, and I think he has probably a better graphic to represent that. I think it's more of a, 
an, an impact, and I might try to actually borrow his, put his into here, because it has a really good story. So Sun Transit, we're doing, you know, we're meeting, doing what we can to meet the demand of Houston. In 2010, we were looking at 75,000 riders a day. This is throughout our system, which is light rail, heavy rail, regional express. 2017, that was up to 163,000. And then 2040, we're looking at somewhat up there closer to the number of 700,000 riders a day. So the system expansion. So our existing system today, 2018, we have light rail from the University of Washington through downtown Seattle to the airport and then to Angle Lake. And I like to point out on that alignment that one of the stations is Tukwila International Boulevard Station, which figures part into the BRT system. And I'll, I'll explain how this all ties together later. We run Sounder Rail from Everett to Seattle and then Sounder from Lakewood to Seattle. And then we have 28 Regional Express bus systems that are operating today. So the next big event will be in 2021. We'll be opening up to the university and then to Northgate and Roosevelt. So that we expect that to be a nice, really bump in ridership and relieve some nice I-5 I corridor, corridor pressure. We'll be adding some more parking lot to the Sounder Rail system. This is also important as Sounder ridership continues to rise as all of our other ridership does. 2022, we're looking at the extension of Tacoma Link down to the hilltop. And then 2023 is the next really big year for Sound Transit. We'll be opening up East Link, which is the blue line on your map. This is the light rail that goes across I-90 to Mercer Island, to Bellevue, through Bellevue, ultimately out to Redmond. And this again is a really nice key feature to point out with the BRT, because the 405 BRT will actually meet East Link at downtown Bellevue. And Cynthia is going to talk about the 405, but the BRT, North segment and South segment, both begin and end in, the, in downtown Bellevue. So again, we're helping tie together the whole system by running the BRT into those into those stations. And then we have Kent and more Auburn, more parking for Sounder, which continues to grow. 2024, just a year after East Link is the next big year. That's when we open the extension to Linwood. We like to mention that because the 522 BRT will tie into the South Shoreline Station, which will be built as part of Linwood. The 405 BRT ties into the Linwood light rail at Linwood. So you can, this is, if you look at the map, you can see kind of the yellowish orange on the right, see how the BRT really ties a lot of this stuff together, particularly on the east side. In addition to running into one, two, three, four, four light rail systems, four light rail stations, running into all the lines, plus the regional express, working with community transit and other partners, it all really, really, really ties up this east side very nicely. And then we have some more parking on Sounder and then that's the two BRT lines opening in 2024. 2030, we're looking at the extension to West Seattle and then down to Tacoma Dome for light rail. 31, we're gonna start infilling some stations. Northeast 130th is an infill station on Linwood, a couple um, stations to the south of downtown Seattle. 2035, we'll get to Ballard. And I live in Ballard and I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully I'm retired by then and riding it for, for leisure and not for work. 2036, light rail to Everett, and then Sounder extended down south to DuPont and Tillicum, and then we'll be adding more capacity to the Sounder line. 3039, more light rail extensions down in Tacoma. 2041, and that's gonna be the purple line, which will be light rail from South Kirkland back through downtown Bellevue, somewhere running into the East, East Link line on its way out 90 to Issaquah. So we have this, this system, I just went through this. So I will simply want to put it as a little book and just flip through it and you can watch it grow as one of those, those picture books. But it's, it's an aggressive program. It's a big program, ST3 was $54 billion. So there's lots to do. And part of getting these projects implemented quickly is our system expansion plan has a series of groups that we like to set, set up. To have, this is to help us with roadblocks. This is to help us deal with issues. This is how to keep the projects moving. One of these is elective leadership group. And those groups are gonna be two, one for the 405, one for 522. There'll be Sound Transit board members on there, as well as elected officials. And I think there's gonna be some Bothell involvement as well on both of those, which is fantastic. 
We're gonna have interagency staff groups, and this is the working groups. This is where we deal with the nuts and bolts of the day-to-day -day issues as they come up. We've already started out with Bothell, Aaron, Steve, Eddie. We've all been working together already as we go through our consultant selection to get these projects going. There's gonna be a stakeholder process, which again, we can focus on the immediate community needs, what their concerns are, what their issues are, get those addressed, get those, get something in front of us, get those addressed with the whole point of, how, of moving to earlier agreement on what exactly this project is gonna look like and we can move them forward into construction. Particularly in BRT, this is important. 2024 is actually a very, it's a very aggressive schedule. So we have no time to waste on that and we're moving forward now and we're gonna to continue to move forward with that. So again, thank you for joining the team. We appreciate your help on that. And then our big issue right now is to get to the preferred alternative by the end of this year or early next year. And what we're looking to do is take the ST3 project on 522, 405, and actually find some of the little nuances. Those nuances include where the parking garage is gonna be, what our bus system's gonna be, and get all that in front of the Sound Transit Board. In this year, early next year, here's our preferred alternative. We wanna move that forward into our environmental documentation, go through the environmental clearance process. So that was basically my, my part of the presentation. I went through it pretty quick. But the point, the takeaway is a lot of projects to be built. We're putting the system together and the BRT 522.045 really ties this all together with all the other system on that side. So we're excited about that. We're getting the leadership teams put together and our agency teams have already started to work. And then we're gonna move forward as, with this project as efficiently as we can. And with that, I was gonna turn this over to, I think Cynthia's going next. Just real quick, we have a quick question for you. Sure. The elected leadership group, um, well, at least I'm not aware of that. Is there a selection process or how does, how does uh, one of us, seven of us get to throw our name in the hat? I haven't had oh. a chance to, um, one, brief the mayor on this, but it was an item that I was gonna bring forward either for um, the 20th or the first meeting in March. So an item for you to make that selection at the dais to both of those committees. Oh, okay. Is that in timely enough? Yeah. Oh, I guess great. we can't really do it now if we wanted to because it's a study session. Okay. That's very perfect. Hi. Um, so, uh, council would have two options. They could uh, make a motion to amend the tonight's agenda to add that um, so that it would be part of the formal agenda, or we could wait until the 20th to make sure that it's on there. But it's timely enough to, if we're on the 20th? Yeah, that would be fine. Okay. Yeah. Everybody's nodding, all right, just making sure. Thank you. Is there any other questions of this? Sorry, I wasn't here when you introduced yourself. I'm Paul. Paul. Cornish. Cornish, uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you. You bet. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, as he mentioned, I am Cynthia Padilla. I am one of the project managers of the BRT program, and Kathy Leota is another one, and we also have two others who are not here tonight, um, Paige Curitan and Andrea Tall. So you'll see their faces around as well. So we're gonna get into what is the meat of this BRT system, this bus rapid transit system that we are very excited to introduce to everybody because it's a new line of business for Sound Transit. Uh, BRT brings fast, frequent, and reliable service to the region through features such as off-board payment, buses arriving every 10 minutes, and bat lanes, or bus access and travel transit lanes, um, which essentially means bus-only lanes, which you can see on 522 now. And our BRT program is scheduled to begin operations in 2024. As Paul mentioned, we have two corridors, one along 522, which starts in Shoreline. It goes from Shoreline to Woodenville. And the other corridor goes from Linwood around 405 to Burien. And that is part of what Kim had spoken about earlier as well. And as Paul mentioned, um, one of the things that we are also excited about is how this BRT system ties into the regional transportation system. So um, at the Linwood Transit Center, we can connect to the North Sound through the I-405 corridor, the BRT. 
and that's at the top of the page there. Uh, and you can see the connection between light rail, both um, in Linwood, and then as we extend up to Everett. And then as we come around the 405, um, we'll connect to the 522 BRT, and the 522 will also connect um, to downtown at, at Shoreline. And then as you continue down, 405 will also connect at Bellevue, and that is where we'll have a transfer. I'll speak about that in a little bit as I s explain 405 in more detail. But we'll connect to Bellevue, the downtown Bellevue state, uh, sorry, the downtown Bellevue station um, at, Bell at the Bellevue Transit Center. And then we can also continue down the 405 and connect to the light rail system to the south end at the Tukwila um, International Boulevard station. And that's why Paul mentioned it earlier. We'll also be um, working with our transit partners, such as King County Metro and Community Transit, as well as our own regional express system to provide some complimentary service to the network. And in addition, sorry, in addition to the BRT running on managed lanes, such as the bat lanes, um, we will be running on the express toll lanes, again, has, as Kim had mentioned, and that's part of what provides this fast, reliable, and uh, frequent service. So the images that you see here are some of the features of the BRT. You'll see level boarding on the top left. And what that means is it's similar to a light rail vehicle if you've been on our light rail where you don't have to step up and down. So that's one of the things we're going to be looking at as we select our vehicles as well as, as we design our stations. And ugh, sorry, precision docking rub rails on the bottom left is another feature that we have, and that helps that level boarding, so it brings the bus really close to the station so that we can have that tight connection between the vehicle and the station itself. On the vehicles, we'll have onboard bike parking. We may have onboard bike parking. And then that center bottom image is called passive restraint. And what that does is it allows the folks in a wheelchair to roll up and they don't have to get strapped into the, um, the vehicle that, as you can see on the buses now. So that helps with that frequent onboarding, getting on and getting off. And another feature of the BRT is offboard bear payment systems where you can tap on or buy your ticket. Again, similar to light rail, where you do that before you board the vehicle, so it's really easy to get on and off. Uh, and you don't have to stop and tap on as you um, enter the vehicle by the driver. And since this system is new to Sound Transit, we are very excited. We'll be doing some new branding, and that's one of the big things that we'll be working on in the first year. Um, we'll also be working very closely with the station design and creating this new brand and this new look to the BRT for Sound Transit. And as we pick our vehicles, we'll also include that branding and that imaging, perhaps a different color, some different logos. Um, that's one of the big things that we're going to be working on in this first year. And the image that you see on the right is an image of a vehicle that has three doors, which also helps with the efficiency of getting people on and off the vehicle. And as we've mentioned, another part of BRT is these what we call managed bus lanes. And on the left, you'll see the bus only lane, an example of a bus only lane. You will see those out in, um, on 522 now. And on the right, another feature is what we call queue jumping um, or bus queue jumping. And what that does is it works with the traffic signal timing so that it gives priority to the buses so that they can kind of jump ahead of the other vehicles on the roadway. And breaking down these pieces of the BRT, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about the I-405 segment. As I mentioned before, this segment has, or the corridor has two segments. You can travel from Linwood Transit Center to the Bellevue Transit Center, and including those two stations, there are seven stations along this segment. Uh, most of the locations have existing bus stops where we will be upgrading those bus stops to include our new branding and our new station imaging. However, we do have the Northeast 85th Street station in Kirkland, which is new, and we're working very closely with WashDOT at that location because they, as part of their master plan, um, it includes not only the BRT station, but also a direct access ramp in that vicinity. So we're working very closely with them, and I don't know that Kim really mentioned that previously. So we thought we'd let you know that. And um, the second segment on this 
corridor goes from the Bellevue Transit Center down 405 and into Burien, to the Burien Transit Center. This segment has five stations that includes both Bellevue and Burien. And it also features a new station at 44th Street in North Renton and a um, new transit center in South Renton. You can see those by the two white dots. And then the connection to, to, to Tequila International Boulevard before we head over to Burien Transit Center. And uh, this system is also requiring an operations and maintenance facility. And what we're doing, working on right now is um, working with our real estate group to secure some property in the Bothell area. It's just north of 405. But the location of this operations and maintenance facility is driven by the location of where the two segments cross. So um, this location of where we're looking at right now is just north of 405 along 527. And it is a very efficient location for us because Bothell is where the two lines meet. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Kathy. Thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and, and uh, Council, and um, happy to be back again. I'm especially happy to uh, welcome several new members to the Council. I thought it might be uh, good to spend a couple minutes giving you a little bit of history of how this particular project uh, came into the ST3 plan, because um, I, I think there's some relevance to how we see the project going forward. So. A few years ago when the Sound Transit Board of Directors was uh, working on work, the whole region, getting input from the whole region on uh, projects to potentially include in the ST3 plan, the first thing, one of the first things they did after doing some initial output was putting out a, a list of candidate projects that were uh, kind of prime candidates to be included in the um, system plan. The 522 BRT project was not one of those projects that the board came out with at that first cut. Um, and that really caused the communities along the uh, North, Was North Lake Washington to uh, really got their attention. Uh, the cities of Shoreline, Lake Forest Park, Kenmore, Bothell um, got very organized and um, a kind of a coalition that also included uh, community groups came together to um, quite insistently um, indicate that the communities along the north end of Lake Washington also need access to a high quality transit system. Um, so very, it was very effective. This, this didn't quite happen anywhere else in the region, but these communities, the cities came together and um, made a, a request to the Sound Transit Board. And uh, what was uh, kind of unique about it is that the request was very consistent over a period of time about what was being asked for. They wanted to, they want the communities in, to be able to also um, be able to use light rail and uh, that was very effective. Um, and so this project uh, ultimately was included in the plan and now we're here before you uh, about to give notice to proceed to our consultants um, in just a couple of weeks to really uh, launch this project. So it's very exciting. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with the communities along the corridor. Uh, very, uh, it's been very cooperative, uh, very positive. Um, so this is the project. Um, Basically, it's providing a high quality connection to the light rail station to its south shoreline. Very frequent service, reliable service, completing the business access and transit lanes, the gaps in that um, system between uh, Bothell and 145th and along 145th, um, having these uh, bus queue jumps uh, as, as uh, Cynthia mentioned. I want to talk a little bit more about what's included in the representative project for the city of Bothell. Just so the representative project, this is the project that was uh, costed out and scoped out in the ST3 plan so that there was a you know, representative set of costs and benefits for the, the region's voters to, to vote upon. So this is our starting point for project development. And this uh, project here you're seeing a diagram of is the representative project and what we'll be doing over the next year, just looking at refinements to that representative project. So. Specifically in Bothell, um, I'm gonna go kind of from the western end of Bothell through Bothell to describe the, the major elements of the representative project. And there are really six capital, types of capital improvements in Bothell from this project. 
on the far west end of Bothell, from the Bothell city limits uh, to Wayne Curve. Uh, your city is already um, well into design of the SR522 multimodal stage three project. Uh, your city is already going to be taking that through design, property acquisition. Our project funds construction of that. So um, that's well underway. Uh, going uh, east of there, there's about a half mile of completion of a business access and transit lane from um, from uh, about northeast 90, from 98th to the w existing bus Q jump westbound. So it's about a half mile, so we'd be adding half mile of that business access and transit lane. The representative project at that point then heads north off of SR 522 to travel along uh, 98th and then east along northeast 185th. The representative project includes uh, two BRT station pairs uh, in downtown Bothell, uh, as well as uh, a p new parking facility in downtown Bothell. So those are um, items, I call them three, Item three is a parking facility. Item four is two BRT station pairs. Now exactly where they're located, these are some of the things that we'll refine. Right now the representative for project assumes one of the BRT station pairs is basically right outside of City Hall. Um, the other one in the representative project is actually quite close. It's over on the other side of um, Bothell of Everett Highway. That was located there because the representative location for parking is there where the parking ultimately lands yet to be determined, but um, but the idea is to provide a BRT station pair that's relatively close to parking. Uh, then the representative of project assumes that tra service travels east along 185th. Um, the fifth big capital item that the project includes is uh, a, a modification to the intersection of 185th and Beardsley Boulevard so that buses can get through that intersection. Uh, and then the last big um, capital improvement is an expanded transit center at uh, UW Bothell Cascadia College. So those are the six major capital elements included in the SR 522 um, project in the Bothell area. Uh, service is every 10 minutes between the UW Bothell and the light rail station and from UW Bothell uh, to uh, Woodenville, it's every uh, 20 minutes. Okay, hmm. how do we turn this? Okay, so here, here's our working schedule. Um, as I mentioned, we are on the cusp of having our consultant on board to uh, take us through the evaluation of refinements to the representative project. We, on the 522 project, we expect them to have notice to proceed before the month is out. And then, um, uh, it's good, things are gonna happen very quickly over the next year, or it's, I think it's gonna feel quick because we, we need to get to a uh, preferred alternative by the end of the, end of the uh, year. Our Sound Transit Board of Directors will um, uh, take input from all of the stakeholders, the elected, uh, elected group, leadership group, um, the interagency inter group, and select the preferred alternative. So that preferred alternative is then the alternative that in the next year um, is the subject of the environmental review and conceptual engineering. So uh, taking it a little further along, you know, probably additional uh, minor refinements. And then uh, after that, the next the year after that would be the board selecting the actual project to be built. From that point, uh, the years 2023-2023, we uh, had final design uh, and then beginning construction with service uh, to begin in the year 2024. We do, our schedule does have some construction going uh, beyond uh, 2024. Um, this is because our, our folks who know a lot about construction are, uh, realize we have a lot on our plate. Our, our, goal is, our goal is certainly to get as much uh, c constructed before um, service opens, but it's possible that there are some things that are we're finishing up in 2025. So um, there are, uh, here are some, a uh, highlight of some of the needs and opportunities for the city of Bothell. 
Uh, as you may recall, uh, we had a concurrence document which was signed by all the cities along the corridor, and this was kind of a pretty high level uh, document just indicating at a high level how the cities and Sound Transit and our partners, King County Metro and uh, so forth, will be working together um, on this project. The next step is we're developing somewhat more detailed agreements with uh, with the cities along the corridor partnership agreements. We're in the process of developing one uh, with your city right now. It's it's going undergoing review, and it's it's a bit more gets a bit more into roles and responsibilities, and um, also sets the stage for. Uh, future agreements that can will get more specific, such as we anticipate there being a future agreement between Sound Transit and the City of Bothell to um, for construction of that Stage Three multimodal corridor project that I mentioned earlier. Stakeholder outreach and engagement. We will certainly be looking um, to your city, uh, your city staff, for input on the critical stakeholders that we need to want to and need to be working closely with. Uh, we've already spoken with uh, University of Washington uh, Bothell and Cascadia College about ha potentially having a transit, some type of transit forum in the um, springtime that would enable input from uh, the, the, the university communities there. Um, we're we're, we're working on refining exactly what that forum is. We'll be working with the city certainly on the location of that parking facility. We've already mentioned stage three construction. We'll all be working together closely to manage the cost and schedule um, of the project. Uh, cost pressures, as you've probably heard, um, have been affecting any any type of uh, infrastructure project. The, we're finding that the costs of uh, land are increasing very quickly. Uh, construction costs are increasing quickly. The cost of parking facility, parking garages are, are qu quite a bit higher than you know they were even uh, 10, 20 years ago. So that's gonna put some pressure on the project and we'll, we're gonna be watching that closely. And that um, is our high level, level overview. I, and I, again, we've really appreciated working with the city of Bothell, your staff, it's been great and we're, we're looking forward to working even more closely. Um, and we're all here to answer any other questions you might have. Terrific. Cameron, nothing from you tonight, huh? <laughs> Mr. Girl, all right? <laughs> you wore out your voice today already, is that what you said? Uh, questions from council? None, none. Anybody, Deputy Mayor? They always make me go first. <laughs> okay. Um, so this past fall um, at an EAG meeting, um, Peter Rogoff of Sound Transit mentioned that um, BRT could be in jeopardy if we lose the express toll lanes. So um, can I have your take on that and how worried we should be if the legislature decides not to uh, continue toll lanes? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how worried to be or not be, but you are correct. That's what Peter has said, and he said that a couple times. If the southern half of the express toll lanes are not funded, then the Sound Transit Board would have to consider what we do with this project if we move forward with it, if we'd modify it, but that would be a, be a board decision if those express toll lanes were not going to be built in the time that we needed to open up the um, express toll lanes. So that's been talk about the BRT. So that's still the, the, the same uh, situation. You know, everybody's supporting them being funded and opened, and our plan is to have those in place for the BRT in 2024, and if that's not the case, then Sound Trends would have to just have that discussion with their, the board about what we'd want to modify, tweak, or, or change. The reason I ask is because right now, um, between 522 and I-5, we only have, uh, you know, limited express toll lanes. We don't have what the rest of the corridor has, and so would that put in jeopardy BRT for us between 522 and I-5? Because um, it sounds like, you know, maybe we'll have those uh, a fix, a, a partial fix by 2024 if everything goes perfectly. So um, that's a huge concern for us because we have no light rail in sight, and BRT is our, is really, our best hope. Oh, yeah, absolutely, and that, you know, that gets back to the, do we modify it, do we tweak it, what do we do, depending on whatever happens. 
other things that happen on 405. So in other words, the next letter we send, can we get Sound Transit to sign on to that? <laughs> I don't I'm know. not really joking. <laughs> yeah, <I don't> know. <laughs> um, so it also um, something that's concerning me is seeing that the, the current proposed budget uh, from the president excludes all light rail funding. So is there a plan B? Um, we've had the same conversation. I, when I spoke earlier, we were running into both the Linwood station and the South Shrine, and the question is what happens if those don't get funded, that funding gets delayed. It's, it's all part of the same question of what are, the, what are things like the budget and the express toll lanes, what does that mean to the system? And then some, sometimes the board would, would act accordingly to what that situation was. But that's, that's on our radar, too. We actually just had that discussion this morning about we need those stations there to bring the BRT in. Right. Um, the other question I had is, do you, we just saw a BRT, 522 BRT, um, section, and then we saw a 405, but I don't see the connection point there, and are there, uh, has that been worked out, or is that something in process still, or I kind of liked that parking garage that uh, WashDOT showed. I think that would be the perfect spot f to kind of make that connection between 405 BRT and 522. Um, our representative project has um, buses from, the bus, I mentioned a service from UW Bothell Cascadia College to Woodenville every 20 minutes. So that that bus um, would make that connection. Uh, we are going to take a, another look at that during project development. Is that is there is that sufficient? Is there a more frequent connection? What's the other service that our partners, Community Transit and King County Metro, might be providing? But it, it's it's along 195th at um, 405 where the the two services would connect. So potentially the. the if someone wanted to transfer, it would be at the UW Transit Center. It, if someone wanted to transfer, it would be at 195th and uh, 405. Okay. Yeah. Um, the park and ride. So, um, in terms of priorities, the we have five million that was supposed to go to a park and ride from ST2. So, can I assume that our park and ride? has a little bit of an edge in terms of <laughs> um, speed and um, priority? Um, I don't know about speed. Um, so you're talking about the ST2 money. That yeah, was ST2, the, there was five right. million. Yeah, so that was uh, my understanding uh, intended to be a, a partnership or contribution. I um, That's not at this point folded into the the 522 project that I just went over it's still it's still there um, I believe um, you know, I don't want to speak too much out of turn but I do believe that uh, Sound Transit Board Action do you, do you know would do you know more about than I did I think I think Sound Transit Board Action would be required to figure out what exactly to do with that money but yeah I, thank you Cameron Grohl I'm the quarter director and uh, we've had a, a handful of cities that have had money from Sound Transit to that hasn't been spent yet and is in some status. Um, Kathy's right, some kind of Sound Transit board action is gonna be necessary to reactivate those funds. But I think this is a good opportunity to reconsider what that original project was going to do. Is there a way for those funds to be reactivated and perhaps complement the project that we are working on with Sound Transit 3? So that's a conversation we're having with a handful of cities right now, Bothell will be one of those. So we'll be happy to engage with you at first at the staff level and then with the council on how we might approach that. Yeah, just before we you know, go full bore ahead with ST3 for other cities, I'd like for us that kind of got the dregs from ST2 to actually get those dregs, <laughs> so. Well, we'll take a look at what that project would have done um, and again, whether it could be complementary to what we're doing right now or whether they're really two separate projects, but we'll kind of figure it out. I believe it was for parking, okay. to go toward a parking garage, that's why yes. I, I asked. You're probably right. I'd have to go back and refresh my own memory, but, um, uh, and then if there is a way to combine those, um, we'll work internally to see what that mechanism is and advise you on how that goes and how we can do that most effectively. Great, well I hope we can work together to get it done, thanks. Councilmember McNeil. Yes, I had a question on the BRT from Bothell to the 145th. 
So um, transit station, downtown Bothell, how long, I probably asked this several I, times. I know, I, I'm prepared this yeah. time okay. to answer your question. Okay. <laughs> then I, I guess I'll just let you answer it. Okay, so you want to know the travel time by yeah. bus uh, from downtown Bothell. Um, so the travel time from downtown Bothell to downtown Seattle um, would be 44 minutes. That includes time on uh, the bus rapid transit, time on light rail, and the five minute transfer penalty. Um, so the thing about that is this is reliable tr transit time. This is reliable travel time. As, as you know, if you're one of the commuters who takes the bus uh, every day along 522, you get stuck in traffic, you know, very regularly. That's not a, it's not a reliable trip. So this is what makes this different. It's, it's a, a very reliable um, high speed trip. Yeah, so every 10 minutes you can get on a bus and you'll mm -hmm. know 45 minutes later you should be in downtown yes. Seattle, regardless mm -hmm. uh, of traffic. Yeah. Unless there's an accident. For, for, for the most part, most of the most of the way, the buses are outside of um, outside of the general purpose traffic. They're either in business access and transit lanes. Uh, on 145th, there are queue jumps at, at the most congested intersections. So a, a, a very large chunk of, and of course, once you get to light rail, you're completely uh, out of traffic. So. Okay, and then on the 405 corridor. Um, coming from Canyon Park down to UW Bothell. Yes, you want to know that. So that, no. that in order to have true BRT there and beyond, it, let's just say into Bellevue. Okay. The lanes need to be built, correct? Uh, I'm going to let one of the members of the 405 team talk a bit more about that. Um, I'm sorry, you can say, can, just to make sure that I understood the question, you're asking from getting from Canyon Park down to Bellevue, mm -hmm. the lanes need to be built. Um, from Canyon Park, the, but the BRT will be running um, still in the general purpose lane. So I guess I wasn't clear earlier where the plan from Linwood to um, all the way through to Totem Lake is for the BRT to run in a combination of general purpose lanes and some um, bus on shoulder lanes. And then once you get to Totem Lake, well, we, well actually right before Totem Lake, the buses will weave to the center lanes, to the express toll lanes, and then they'll use the existing Totem Lake station. And then from Totem Lake, the current ST representative alignment runs from Totem Lake to Bellevue in the express toll lanes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it sounds, it sounds to me like from from Canyon Park to 128, because 128 is the flyover, right? That's where they have a totem lake. A totem lake, yes. 128. Mm -hmm. So essentially, from right there, that you can be the bus can just get off right there, go to the park and ride, get right back on on the inside lane, and go all the way to Bellevue. From Totem Lake, yes, it gets on the express lanes. But from Canyon Park, the Canyon Park stations will essentially be in the existing locations where they are now. We'll just pick a location somewhere along those areas where we'll find a, um, a spot for the BRT station and provide some upgrades to it. So it'll be on the outside lanes running the general purpose or bust on shoulder depending on time of day and which direction you're traveling. And it'll continue to do that. Um, we're going Canyon Park and then the next one oh, is 195th. That's also on the outside. And then from 195th we'll go down to 160th also on the outside because those are where the existing stations are located. And then once we get past 160th we'll be going weaving into the um, Express, express toll lanes to Totem Lake, and then it'll continue on the express toll lanes to Bellevue. Okay, so just for, just for clarification, do you consider that BRT from Canyon Park to 128? It is still, according to our ST3 representative alignment and the studies that we've done, we're still gonna get that reliable service. And part so, of that part, go ahead. So my next question, the next time I ask the question will be, how long will it take to go from Canyon Park to 128. Don't think I have that data right now. You don't have to answer it now, but okay. I'll, I'll probably be and asking that question. We will find that out. Okay. <laughs> By the Thank next you. time I come back to you. Okay. Councilman Rolson. Yeah. So thanks for the presentation. So will the 522 BRT route eliminate the current 522 route? Um. So. Very, very likely. Our, our ST Express team is, they're conducting a study uh, right now where they're looking at how does our, our ST Express, Regional Express Service change when we have these light rail projects opening. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, you know, there's there's some things that are being considered, um, uh, you know, that could be complementary. But uh, you know, our, our representative project at least assumes that this the service replaces the existing. 522 service, um, you know, it's a, it's a faster, it's going to be a faster way to get into town um, than the current ST Express services. Because some of the early morning routes, I think you can get from Bothell to downtown Seattle in like 30, 35 minutes. So there's no congestion. Um, yeah, it's a exactly. whole different ball game. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, all right. And then. Mm -hmm. So I think Deputy Mayor touched on this a little bit, the parking structures in 522. So there's one plan for that, but for the 405 BRT, there's not really any parking structure kind of in the Bothell area or the Canyon Park, because I think that's one of the fastest growing regions in the state and with populations and more people coming from that specific area, uh. it'd be a great location and maybe for that ST2 money to put in some of those funds as a complementary complementary project. Wow, that's a tough one. Well, uh, well noted on the ST2 money, we'll figure that, we'll find some more information on that. I'm gonna start to answer this question. If Paul has anything to add to it, I'll ask him to come up. Um, but you are correct, as far as the Canyon Park, um, location, we are not, in the ST2 representative project, we are not planning on adding to that, the parking capacity there. Um, I'm just doing a quick thought of the Bothell area, but uh, the next supplement to parking is a little bit further south um, near the Totem Lake Station. So with, I guess, cooperation with community transit, would there be some improvement to local bus routes to get more people to those stations because otherwise there's I don't think a lot of population density around that interchange right there the Canyon Park inter interchange yeah the, that is part of what we're going to be working pretty hard on in this next year or two is working with our transit partners community transit um, and King County Metro Kathy will be working very closely with them especially along 522 and then we'll be working with them along the both corridors. All right, and then last question. So for taking a bus, so is there gonna be a single bus? Can you be on one bus the whole time from Linwood to Burien or is there like a mandatory transfer point in Bellevue Transit Center? Thank you for asking me to clarify that. Um, there will be two buses, so you will have to transfer. If you wanna go all the way from Linwood down to Burien, you'll have to transfer at the Bellevue Transit Center. I think there will be better options than that, but I was just curious yes. if you had to. <laughs> right, depending on where you're going. You do also have the option to transfer to light rail if you want to go to downtown Seattle. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I have a few questions here. So um, if I heard correctly, there's the potential for a parking facility in downtown Bothell, and then you said a transit center at UW Bothell. Is that a parking facility as well, or is it a transit center just a glorified bus stop? Uh, I guess uh, I guess the latter, um, but it's but it's a little what's a little bit different from um, a, a BRT station is uh, at least the representative project assumes it's it, it comes off of the roadway and is um, you know a little road the current transit center at UW Bothell it's a it's a, a little turnaround that has um, two to uh, shelters, um, so we are looking to, you know, have an expanded transit center, so it's no park, no additional parking. Uh, I was thinking, was that the, along Beardsley, that there would be a wider shoulder on, on Beardsley for the buses to pull out? Uh, the representative project has has the, the um, buses uh, coming into campus and um, basically in the same vicinity of the current transit center, which is not on Beardsley, it's actually on the campus. Okay. Yeah. And then the parking facility, though, that's a real parking structure, is the what you were mentioning or what you talked about, about downtown Bothell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have a representative uh, location included in the project, but there, you know, we're, uh, it's unclear if, if that's gonna be the best spot. There are a couple of other options that will be, um, 
taking a look at, um, reporting back to you, working closely with your, your staff on looking at a different options, a couple different options, but we do fairly quickly um, need to get to a preferred alternative, so um, it won't be an exhaustive study. Um, we, we don't have the time for that, so. Because a lot of people travel from a corridor to Snohomish County, we're often called, at least when we're hanging out with Snohomish County representatives, and um, they come through here and they, you know, sooner they can park their car, the less traffic impacts they'll have on Bothell and Kenmore mm -hmm. as they're driving down trying to find a parking spot. So mm -hmm. um, I would employ or please consider putting one in, in Bothell. It, mm -hmm. would, it would help the whole corridor because a lot of the people are coming from, you know, Monroe and that, out in that area. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is kind of my next question is, to, is talking about parking facilities. So ST2, granted, yeah, there was some five million there, but I know Eddie's in the been here since um, we incorporated as a city in 18 uh, <laughs> or whatever year it was. <laughs> but Eddie, do you remember how much money uh, ST2 we actually did have originally in the ST2 plan for a parking structure in Bothell? That's been said that it's a $5 million, and at a time it was to partner with the city of, you know, trying to locate it somewhere in the, the city hall block. Um, as I understand, when I looked at the representative project, that $5 million has been wrapped into this ST, you know, 522 BRT, and, and one of the representative projects is to do a 300 parking, you know, Garage in downtown Bothell, so that that five million is part of that. It's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the ST three project, what we're talking about tonight, pays for the three hundred stall parking garage in downtown Bothell. So that is part of our construction funding is to build a parking garage here, one in Lake Forest Park, one in Kenmore. So three of those along the five twenty two route. Bothell, like a few other cities within the Sound Transit jurisdiction, has um, a project from ST2 that never got built. So if those funds can be reactivated, again, that's a choice of the board, that's about $5 million, that could complement the project that you do have funded as a part of ST3. Okay. So they are in addition. So, it, but again, I don't have the authority to say you have $5 million to spend, that's above my pay grade. Um, but we can identify what that project was gonna be used for, figure out if there's a, a project here that could be done complementary to the ST3 project, whether it's additional parking access, there may be other couple of different options we can look at, and then work with the board to see if that can be reactivated. So it's, so I guess, I guess that's my, uh, from what I understand, it's just a memory in my head, but I, I, I swear when ST2 originally happened, it wasn't 5 million. What I was trying to get at that is that what I understand it was like 20 million or 25 million or something like that, that there, were, and then it got, you know, whatever. It, then it ended up being 5 million to try to work with us to do something. Yeah, we'd be happy to do the research and see what was in ST2 and what might, and Erin might have some of those figures. I see she's wandering up here right now. No. But between the cast of characters you have in here, we'll find out what the answer is um, and report back to you on that. But the remaining sort of money that was not spent, I, I would concur that that number is 5 million. Okay. Yeah, it was somebody, I think it was on the ST2 board that told me that. It was a, it was a standalone parking structure back in the day and it was big and um, yeah, anyhow. Well, like I said, we'll, we'll be happy to do that. And we're happy to do that with a few other cities where we're looking back at those details and seeing what happened, what kind of documentation is there, and then what, what can we do to consider reactivating it. Yeah. Because with the the cost overruns and the, and the rapid schedule, I'm just I'm just a little concerned that if we get passed over again, um, with no parking structure in Bothell with ST3, and then if what I heard was correct about ST2, yeah. Well, I think the cost is a challenge that we have system wide, and we mentioned it because I think it's important for us to be always always honest and as frank as we can be. Cost is a pressure that we're facing right now. You see it in the news, you see the uncertainty that Deputy Mayor brought up 
uncertainty with federal funding. It's a fact of life. Um, so less about being passed over and more about how do we manage this collectively together. So we've kind of got a mutual oar in the water to talk about how do we build this project, all of the elements of this project within the available budget. So that's our collective challenge along the whole corridor there. So roadway improvements in Bothell will cost something, roadway improvements in Kenmore will cost something, Lake Forest Park, et cetera. We need to try to work with those communities to make the most cost-effective solution we can, the best performance at the, at the most competitive cost so that we can afford to do all of the elements. We have our pleasure to work with you to make sure that we do those elements here in Bothell. So that kind of goes into my next question. So the, the Canyon Park um, uh, facilities, so it's a it's a bus garage basically that would house all buses for 405 and 522 or is it part of them or is it, I mean how many buses are we talking about, do we know? I think it's it's uh, planned for 60 to 80 buses um, and it's, uh, it's an element that's necessary to provide the bus rapid transit service. So we do need a, operations and maintenance facilities. So they'll both house the buses when they're being stored, so overnight when they're not in service, and they can be repaired, maintained, uh, fueled um, at that facility so that they can then be deployed. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, it does need to be within proximity of the crossover point, so we have been looking at a representative site here. I'll note that, again, just like with parking garages, we are looking at some different options here, so we may not land on that site that we've already been looking at, um, but uh, this certainly be one of the sites we'll consider very strongly. And we've been working with your with your staff um, and talked to you about that since we were here last July. Uh, so continue to work on that in this coming year. So just, so I had said it on the record, if, if we didn't get a parking garage in ST2 and we thought we were, and then we didn't get one in ST3 and we, thought we were in them, but we got a parking or a facility to repair buses and park them in our regional growth center. We're gonna have a big issue up here in Bothell with you guys. So I just wanna kind of put that that marker out there I in the field. It. message, yeah. message received. We're, we're working on all of those elements. So we wanna deliver all of those elements. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a question, probably more for staff with the, so, so the Canyon Park and kind of where you were explaining, I think it's, it's in within our regional growth center, is that? A fair assumption, okay. If that property is used as a bus facility, will we still be able to meet our regional growth center targets for the Canyon Park Regional Growth Center? I'm looking at you, Bruce. <laughs> hey, where's Gary? Gary was here. Good evening, everybody. I actually wasn't prepared to speak, so uh, here's the situation. We actually would have to take that into consideration, but don't forget we do have a little bit of a surplus up there. So we do have a little bit of leeway in the Canyon Park Regional Growth Center to, you know, if we had to lose some capacity, we could probably survive that type of an area. I believe the property they're looking at is about 12 acres in size. So that would probably still be within our growth target if we lost that much area. We just have to build more densely in the remainder? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, or plan think, for, I should say. I don't think we'd have to build more densely in the rest of the area, but we would. it would be felt, yes. It'd be felt, but we could still, you're confident? Or yes, you feel I am confident we <laughs> could still meet our, our target, our growth target, sorry. Because that's super important to us too, just so you guys know, okay. That's been conveyed. Um, so, sorry, my notes aren't so good. I think that's all the questions that I had. Um, is there any other council members that didn't get a chance to make comments or questions? Yeah, we're, everybody's good, okay. Thank you, appreciate you coming out. It's our pleasure and I'll note that uh, we started our tour with city councils last July here in Bothell. Um, we'll likely go back to the other cities now that we've started again uh, with Bothell here tonight. So we appreciate your par partnership and look forward to working with you. Awesome, we appreciate your partnership too, thank you. Okay, I believe that's the end of our agenda. Is there anything you wanna sue people over, city attorney, or we need to go to executive session, or? Not today. Okay, great. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Moved by uh, Council Member McNeil, seconded by Deputy Mayor. All those in favor, actually, just, we can use the buttons. City Clerk, we're good, okay. Any discussion on the motion?
Go ahead, place your boat. All right, we are adjourned.